Hello and welcome to You Talking to Me. Almost 150 heads of states and governments were in Paris this week, where the International Climate Conference started, also called COP21. Everybody underlined the need to act against climate change. But what can we expect from COP21? That's what we are going to discuss today. I'm very happy to welcome in our studio Magdalena Skajewska from Polsky Radio. Hello. Hi. Hi. And Nikola Miladinov from Bulgarian National Radio. Hello, thank you for welcoming me. And uh, later on we are going to be joined by other journalists of our network. Uh, Magda, Poland uh, is quite a, a, a main player, an important player, let's say, in the European Union when it comes to climate uh, change. Ahead of COP21, the new Polish government announced that uh, it will fight even harder to stay with coal uh, in, in the country. And a member of the parliament uh, for the law and justice uh, party, uh, which is leading the comp uh, country now, even said that Poland might not sign an agreement uh, in Paris. Do you think that is possible? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, given that the Polish economy is based on coal um, and given that the, at least what the experts say, the quick transition from coal is not really possible in Poland, um, it's quite understandable that um, we are um, the country that is fighting pretty pretty hard um, to for uh, solutions that will not undermine the development of Poland. But on the other hand, Poland is also saying that a global agreement in Paris is necessary, is important and is needed. And um, to be honest, I don't think that Poland would block um, the, the agreement. Of course, we've got pretty high expectations. The Polish um, government and Prime Minister um, Bata Szydło, when she um, went to Paris, she said that uh, Poland has two uh, main expectations. First of all, it needs to be a universal deal, a true global deal, so that it's not only the European Union who has high um, high objectives and high goals when it comes to the climate um, policy, but it needs to be um, something more broad. And, uh, and second of all, that the agreement needs to take into account the particular um, needs and particular um, conditions of, uh, of specific countries. So including Poland, of course, where uh, the economy is based on coal. Now, whether that's possible, that's, I think, for the negotiators and experts to, um, to judge. But I don't think that Poland in Paris will block the deal. I think what the current government is um, trying to do and will try to do is more to, f to fight uh, among the EU member states. So you expect uh, your government to renegotiate afterwards? After Paris? Well, this kind of um, comments um, have already been made by the politicians from the Law and Justice Party, who is now in the government. In the government, you mentioned uh, also one of the, the the comments about the Paris Paris deal. So we can. We can see, uh, we can notice very clearly that the current government will try to um, to mitigate, if if I may, mm -hmm. the negative effects of the EU deal that was made uh, in October 2014. And I think next year will be crucial for this European uh, debate uh, with Poland, um, what exactly it will mean in practice and how is it, whether it's possible and how is it possible to mitigate and mitigate minimize the negative effects to the economy. Okay, so uh, we'll see in 2016. So maybe uh, we have a look at the industry's uh, expectation. On the Paris conference, we asked the representative of the metals industry, and he told us that the sector is backing a globally binding agreement. Uh, let's listen to Guy Tiran from Eurometo. The metals industry is a global industry, it faces international competition and is operating under a global pricing system, which means that additional costs cannot be passed down to its customers. And that's why Eurometo is very much uh, supporting what's happening in Paris, and it hopes very strongly that it will lead to a global international agreement, but a binding international agreement. Because we believe that if there is no binding international agreement, we will fail, the world will face, will fail achieving the two degrees objective that it had set, and we will not have 
global level playing field that's so important for an industry like ours. So we have Pia Oppel from the Luxembourgish uh, Public Radio 100.7. She's in Paris at uh, COP21 right now. Hi, Pia. Hi, Daniel. Uh, the representative uh, from European metals industry is asking for binding targets. Uh, so far, it does not seem very likely that uh, this will really be the result uh, in Paris, given the fact that China and the US uh, are opposed to sign an agree agreement with uh, binding targets. Yes, that is uh, true. The US government, for instance, considers it unlikely that an agreement with binding targets can pass the Republican-led Senate. President Obama has clarified yesterday that the U.S. wants large parts of the potential Paris Agreement to be legally binding, but still not the national reduction commitment. The EU has just confirmed here in a press conference that it wants the targets to be binding, but when you talk to people close to the negotiations, it sounds as if the EU's willingness to compromise could prevail on that point. The risk being that history repeats itself uh, if the U.S. does not ratify the agreement as it already did with the Kyoto Protocol. A compromise could mean that it will be binding that each country has to reach a target, even if it can set a target for itself on a national level. And then there is also the idea of a review process, meaning that targets get strengthened every five years or so. So it really is too early to say whether a level playing field will be guaranteed with this agreement here. With regard to what the representative from the European metals industry says, it's um, actually interesting to mention that, for instance, the U.S. climate scientist James Hansen has serious doubts that these national reduction targets are actually the best way to create fair conditions for the industry sectors around the world. What he proposes is a carbon fee that uh, would be raised in all the main economies. Um, on the other hand, I have to mention that uh, there is uh, um, a debate here in Paris about carbon pricing, so-called carbon pricing, meaning all kinds of mechanisms that would establish a price for CO2 emissions worldwide. But these proposals are very, very vague, um, which is probably why environmental NGOs consider them as nothing more than smoke screens. Interesting indeed. Uh, Pia, you followed the speeches of the national leaders uh, in Paris. What's your general reaction? Uh, were you impressed by some or disappointed by others? Um, I have to admit I was uh, surprised by the clarity of the language that most uh, world leaders used. U.S. President Obama admitted that the United States are in significant parts responsible for causing the problem of climate change. Russia's President Putin said that climate change is a threat for the economy and one of the gravest challenges humanity faces. Then uh, China's President Xi has mentioned that his country is contributing to tackling climate change. So all this sounded as if everyone agreed, but of course that's not the case, or at least not entirely. And this has become apparent as soon as the heads of state and government left on Monday night. Since then, the conference center here at Le Bourget in the suburbs of Paris is in the firm hands of the negotiators. And on this technical level, things have not moved forward. As expected, the draft text of the agreement is still pretty long with many important passages in brackets, meaning that there is no consensus yet. Laurent Fabius, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, who chairs this meeting, said today at a press conference, and I quote, we have to speed up things because there is still a lot of work to do. Uh, indeed. Uh, thank you, Pia. Uh, Nicola, uh, in uh, Bulgaria, uh, the fact that we will probably not have uh, an agreement with binding uh, targets rose the question of uh, renewable energy, of the commitments uh, regarding renewables. Indeed, uh, the major point here is that uh, uh, we have a dilemma whether to continue overall as a, as a European economy in the EU to use fossil fuels in the long term or not. Because by the end of the day, when we talk about reduction, uh, CO2 reduction, it's about fossil fuels. 
And uh, obviously, if you look at the, at the broader picture, this ambitious pledge from the EU for 30% reduction, uh, the whole idea was to make, to push the big players like the US, like China, Brazil, India and, and the others to engage for similar ambition, uh, ambitious national targets in a binding way. So they also have to let go the fossil fuels one way or another. And uh, if we see that uh, the efforts, the investments and the um, price um, leverage on the electricity for households uh, sacrificed by this uh, um, shift of the econ economy, which would be beneficial, according to me, in the long term, because if we shift to renewables in the long term, it could be beneficial. But so far, uh, I don't see the results of this. And uh, we have to know that there is a point of do it, doing this. And if, if the, the big players just say, oh, we, we want to stay competitive because we are in a global economy uh, and uh, we also in smaller countries want to be competitive. I, I suppose uh, the Polish industries uh, might be uh, the same. But the, the uh, one, more, one more, more point I, I, I want to make, uh, you have to look... Uh, not the, only the uh, biggest pollute, polluting country in Paris now, but also the ones who have most interest of this deal to fail. I mean the oil producers mm -hmm. and the, any other energy lobbies who are now trying to, to destroy this deal. So uh, my conclusion is in the EU, the energy fossil fuel lobby is weaker since we have this mm -hmm. pledge. It's Obviously, in the US, when we, t uh, we talk about the Congress, this lobby is still much stronger, let alone China, uh, which would not, uh, I think, make a move without uh, seeing first what Washington would do. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to Italy. Uh, Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi was uh, pledging very much in favor of uh, binding targets. We have Gigi Donnelli from uh, Radio 24 on the phone. Ciao, Gigi. Ciao, Danielle. Um, Gigi, your environ environmental minister said that Italy is ready to be the avant-garde in Paris. Do you see this position also in the government's actions at home, given, for example, the fact uh, that uh, a huge amount of electricity is produced out of gas in Italy? Indeed. Well, you know, uh, out of the very nice declaration, being an avant-garde or not, it sounds a bit strange to me from the historical point of view, but what is sure is that the story of energy in this specific moment in Italian history is the story of two big companies, basically. One is ANL, the other is ENI. So ANL um, is uh, the main producer of electricity, is the main, uh, let's say, player in this uh, moment. And what ANL actually has been doing since it's not a country able to access to fossil as much as other country, has been working already on the transformation and he already had a plan for transforming toward, uh, uh, well, first of all, toward a phasing out of coal investment and uh, focusing instead on the kind of innovative, you know, diversified, and uh, finally, possibly, completely carbon-neutral business. So uh, when Matteo Renzi, is not by chance that during his statement, he specifically quote these two companies, and uh, the new board, and I'm talking about the board that was... Uh, um, that took place at the beginning of 2015 of this huge Italian company has this plan, which is exactly to uh, push on this transformation process that will allow the, the Italian company to invest on its skill and technology. So, yes, uh, Italy is part of the country who has all to gain from a fixed target, and that's why probably, again, today, our Minister for Environment insisted that we have to fix a binding uh, agreement, at least, he said, 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, uh, for all the world. So, yes, Italy has all the reason to, to keep uh, 
this direction. Okay, once more about uh, binding uh, agreement, uh, and we have uh, time for one more um, point. Uh, we have Claudia Knopke from uh, German AMS on the phone. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Danielle. Uh, your German, the German Chancellor announced to spend more money on the protection of forests in the south, and uh, which uh, leads us to the question of equality in fighting climate change, a very in, uh, important question, Claudia. And you were working today on a study issued by Oxfam saying that especially the rich are responsible for climate change. Yeah, and it's not only a question of equality in fighting climate change, it's also a question from my point of view of the right perspective. And this study, um, let's say it helps to change the perspective a little bit, especially for me as German coming from a rich country, because Oxfam says the richest 10% of the world population are responsible for half of the CO2 emissions. So that's the figure. Oxfam compares, for example, the poorer half of the population in China with uh, the richest U.S. citizens. And according to the Oxfam study, these 600 million Chinese cause only a third of the emission of 30 million of the 30 million richest Americans are causing. So it's a little difference, I would say. And that is all because much of what is consumed by the richest, I mean, you and me and the richest Americans, is not produced in our countries, in our home countries of the rich, but in the poor developing countries. And on the other side, especially the people in the poor and poorest regions of the world are particularly affected by climate change, such as storms and floods or droughts. And now that is one of the criticisms uh, by Oxfam. In Paris, the countries are rated only by what amount of emission is produced on their own territory, but not who are the beneficiaries. So maybe we should think about that. Much more to think about it. Uh, COP21 will end on December 11 and we will, of course, continue to follow the event. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Magda. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you all and see you soon on You Talking to Me. Music